Hi all, and welcome to the Medical AI Lab uh, reading session. Today we have uh, Morgan Sanchez um, talking to us about uh, DeepMind's work, Gato, um, or a generalist agent. So without further ado, Morgan, take it away. Sure. All right, you see everything? Yeah. Awesome, thanks so much. Yeah, my name is Morgan and I'm gonna be talking about this new paper, um, a generalized agent um, that came out of DeepMind by Scott Reed, Conrad Zonla, and Emilio uh, Perisotto et al. And for today's presentation, just to go through uh, what we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna start off with some highlights of the model that the paper focuses on. Um, I'm going to state the hypotheses that they present, talk a little bit more about model characteristics, how they train it, and some specifics regarding deployment. And then uh, they have a lot, a lot of experiments and results. Um, so I'm gonna talk about most of them, um, but we can definitely discuss them afterwards. Uh, they, prevent, they present some results on simulated control tasks, robotics, image captioning and dialogue, um, how the model scales according to size, um, how it performs on out of distribution tasks. And then as we'll learn about a little bit later, Gato is a generalist and they also look at Gato as a specialist. Um, then I'm gonna end with some ethical considerations and some conclusions. And then of course we can discuss both technical and ethical things um, afterwards. So the model that the paper is centered on is DeepMind's Gato. And some highlights are that it's one network, um, one set of weights, and it's multimodal, multitask, and multi-embodiment. Um, and it can do things like playing Atari games, chatting with someone, um, captioning images, um, stacking blocks, um, in a physical environment and lots and lots of things, both in simulated and real environments. Um, so this is just their first figure where they kind of show a bunch of the different tasks that Gato can do. Um, it was trained on 604 distinct tasks um, in various modalities, observations and action specifications. So right, it can do things like chat with someone, it can caption the image, um, it can move blocks using a robotic arm, and then it could play all these games. So the primary hypotheses that they uh, present are that it's possible to train an agent that is generally capable on a large number of tasks, as opposed to, you know, one specific task. Um, and it can be adapted to accomplish even more tasks if you add a little bit of extra training data for the task that you want it to do. Um, as well as scaling compute and model parameters as well. So some key model characteristics are that um, because they wanted to be able to use this for real-time deployment, um, especially considering one of the tasks was a uh, robotics um, demonstration or a robotics task, they um, trained 100, sorry, 1.2 billion parameters um, it was trained on a very, very large variety of data from diverse modalities. So images, text, you know, button presses, joint tor torques, and so much more. Um, and the model consists of two primary components. So it has an embedding function, which basically takes the input that has been tokenized and outputs token embeddings. And um, the embedding function actually um, functions in different ways, depending on the type of input it gets. So um, it uses a ResNet block and a learnable position encoding vector for each image patch that it receives. And then otherwise, for any other type of data, um, it uses a lookup table into a learned vector embedding space. The second component of the model is a sequence model 
um, and they used a 24 layer transformer. And this basically outputs a distribution over the next token. Um, the model was trained offline in a supervised way. And they know that they could have used reinforcement learning, um, but they simply chose not to. Um, and they trained it for four days. So just to jump in a little bit into the tokenization that they use, um, this isn't super, super important, but I'm just gonna provide a couple of examples. Um, and this is where they essentially serialize all of the data into a flat sequence of tokens. So for text, um, they use sentence piece, um, which basically maps the text onto integers between zero and 32,000. For images, right, they take their image and they um, turn into a sequence of patches um, in the order that they appear in the image, basically. Um, they normalize those patches and scale them according to the patch size. For discrete values, um, they flatten them into sequences of integers um, and continuous values, they basically just map them onto um, integer values. And um, this, this is a good figure that they have. This is their second figure where it kind of illustrates some of this uh, tokenization and how, um, how the model looks, how the architecture looks a little bit. Um, so for example, right, you have um, one task which would uh, consist of like Atari images and discrete actions like where you're playing a game and you could provide it with the observations or the images, right? The light purple is image and the dark purple is an action. And then these are um, like sequentially input into the model. And then there's text, right? Where it's just a sequence of tokens. Um, and then the uh, robotic arm task, um, which has a combination of um, images and actions. And then, um, right, we have our captioning, which has images and text as well. And it's all, it's all embedded um, using the Gato model. So when uh, they actually deploy the model, they do it in a number of steps. That, um, and this is like an example of using deployment as a, uh, in the form of a policy. And so the first thing that they do is they prompt the model um, and they, they mentioned that this is optional, um, but they essentially demonstrate the task, um, similar to one of the previous papers that we talked about. So they demonstrate the task that they want the agent to perform, and then um, they provide it with um, observations for the environment that the agent is in. These observations, which you can see over here, are tokenized and appended um, to the sequence. And then once Gato looks at the, um, makes the observations essentially, um, it samples from an action vector um, one token at a time. That action is decoded and um, that's done like by reversing the tokenization that I talked about earlier. Um, and then the action is sent into the environment where like the action is performed, um, whether it's a simulated environment or a real environment and um, a new observation is obtained um, of the current state of the environment. And then essentially that just repeats until um, the uh, game or whatever you're doing is finished. So they trained um, this model on a whole bunch of data, um, a number of control environments with a varying number of tasks. Um, vision and language data sets um, like COCO um, and like one of the control environments, right, is like a real environment um, with a real robot stacking blocks. So just to jump into some results, um, this, this plot is really cool. Um, it took me a second to sort of figure out what was going on, but essentially um, on the x-axis, we're looking at the um, threshold as a percent of the expert score. And on the y-axis, we're looking at the number of tasks above that threshold. So for example, 
the model was able to accomplish um, 450 tasks at over 50% of the expert score. Right, and that's, that's basically how you read this. And then when you're looking at each of the environments, um, you can look at sort of the width of each of these um, parts of the plot. And you can see, for example, for baby AI, um, it was able to achieve 80% of the expert score for nearly all of the levels. Um, and even the most difficult tasks were comparable to other baselines. So, you know, what I'm looking at here, right, are these arrows that the width is basically the same all the way from zero all the way to like almost almost 90, I want to say, but um, they talk about a little bit over 30, uh, a little bit over 80. So they also um, show some results for um, robotics, specifically the task of skill generalization. So for this task, um, the agent is asked to stack objects of previously unseen shapes. So they withheld some shapes from the training set and then evaluated the performance. Um, and here they basically show that the agent was able to outperform existing benchmarks or an existing benchmark um, on a number of groups of unseen shapes. Um, so you could see like group one, group three, and group five. Um, Gato is actually winning or, or pretty comparable. And then over in, on average, it's actually pretty comparable um, to the baseline. And then they they kind of they kind of uh, skim over these tasks, these image captioning tasks and dialogue tasks. But I just wanted to present a few examples. Um, right, they for the image captioning, right? You know, white horse with a blue and silver bridle. That's you know, I would say that's pretty good. Um, the first caption for the surfer photo um, is not as great, but the next two are pretty good. Um, so you can see that, you know, something that's really cool about this model is that it can do so many tasks um, and it's, it's one set of weights, one model, um, which is just really outstanding. Um, and then I just have an example of the dialogue here. Um, I don't know, when I read these, they didn't seem that bad, but they mentioned that sometimes the dialogue is not super accurate. Um, and you can kind of tell that you're not talking to a real person. Um, but overall, I just think this is really cool. Um, the next part of their analysis that they do is they look at how the model, um, how the performance uh, changes as the model scales. And the main thing that I take, take out of this plot here is that essentially, um, it seems to just grow, right? It seems like you can see consistent improvement as um, the model increases in size. Um, and this is really exciting because, um, you know, as hardware improves um, and as like we get better at, you know, making architectures that are more efficient, um, it's going to be able to generalize to more and more tasks and perform better and better. Even for those tasks like the image generation, sorry, not image generation, image captioning and um, dialogue generation um, that it you know, performed not quite as well on. Um, the next set of results is on out of distribution tasks. Um, so they thought about um, literally just one shot or zero shot um, trying tasks that are out of distribution, um, but instead they ended up just fine tuning on a small number of uh, training tasks to do this. So basically what they did for this is they trained on all data, right, um, that I mentioned previously for the other results. And then they also try, um, how it try to look at how it performs when it's pre-trained on um, each of these three um, sets of data. So uh, data that's in the same domain, only uh, no control data, and then um, no pre-training. So from scratch. And essentially what they see is that these two, um, so they purposely held out these four tasks 
um, so, that, so that they could do this analysis. Um, and essentially for these two, these are um, non-image tasks. And they see that basically training with um, all the data is better than you know, training on data with um, only the same domain. Um, but it's uh, not much better to um, train from scratch than to do no control data, probably because um, there's no images involved. Um, and then for Atari boxing, for example, um, they don't see much of a difference uh, whether they pre-train or not, which was just an interesting finding. Um, and then moving on to Gato as a specialist, which was another part of the analysis that they did. Um, essentially, you know, the goal of the agent, right, is that it's a general purpose agent and that it can um, accomplish, it can do well on a variety of tasks, kind of like we can, right, as humans. Um, but they also tested it as a specialist. So um, seeing how it performs in a single domain um, when it's trained in a single domain. And then, um, so they found that it attained state-of-the-art performance um, using the architecture that they used for the generalist for, on smaller scales. So just jumping in uh, finally to some ethical implications, um, because I personally was not, you know, fully aware that we were quite at this point where we were able to achieve general purpose agents. Um, I thought that was pretty far off. Um, so it's definitely important to consider these ethical implications. Um, so uh, generalized AI is kind of an emerging area of research because it's only recently become like relatively tractable. Um, and people are currently developing tools for mitigating the harms of generalist agents. Um, but those tools are pretty underdeveloped because the field is just emerging. Um, one of the concerns is that generalist agents, um, unlike a lot of the uh, machine learning that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, can take actions in the real physical world, you know, where there are real physical consequences. Um, so that's just something that we have to keep in mind as we're developing these types of models. Um, we can, for example, misplace our trust in an agent that is not um, performing as well as it should, uh, as we think it is. And, um, you know, this is, this is very similar to, you know, even specialist agents. Um, there are, of course, um, concerns about bad actors getting access to a generalist agent um, and being able to do, you know, really anything they want with it. And then, um, of course, there's also the issue of unexpected and undesired outcomes. And this is especially of concern for certain behaviors, right? A lot of the games that you can play are like fighting games, fighting arcade games. And you wouldn't want those behaviors to um, be taken from the simulated realm to the real world realm. And sort of the object of developing general purpose agents are that they are able to transfer knowledge across domains. So that's why it's such a, such a concern. Um, and then jumping in finally to some conclusions, um, they conclude that transfer sequence models are effective as a multitask, multimodal and multi-embodiment. Um, agent um, that can handle text, vision, and robotics tasks. Um, and they even show promise when they are fine-tuned for out-of-distribution tasks. Um, and because of that um, model size um, analysis that they did, they feel that performance for those poor scoring tasks will scale pretty well with uh, increased model size, more data and more compute, um, especially as better hardware and architectures are developed. 
And, you know, one of the biggest conclusions that I took away from this paper, like I mentioned previously, is that maybe general purpose agents are not quite as far off as we think that they are, uh, which is kind of exciting and a little scary, but also exciting. Um, and there we go. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this presentation. And I'd love to hear any of your thoughts or questions um, about the paper, um, about the ethical implications, anything like that. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Morgan. This is fantastic.